I'm so very, very happy to see all of you here today. My name is Kevin Kearns. I'm on the faculty at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, and I also have the honor of leading the Johnson Institute for Responsible Leadership. The Johnson Institute and GISPIA have been incredibly honored to host the new Francis Hesselbein Leadership Forum, which will be a continuation of the legacy of one of the most highly respected experts in the field of contemporary management and leadership development across all sectors, but especially in the nonprofit sector. For those of you who may not be familiar with Francis's name and her reputation, she gained national notoriety for transforming the Girl Scouts of America from a struggling and uh, declining organization even into a vibrant and inclusive leadership development program for girls in every corner of the country. And many of those corners had been neglected in previous years. She then founded the Peter Drucker Foundation for Nonprofit Management in New York, which evolved into the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Institute. She's co-authored or authored over 25 books that have been published and translated into languages around the world. She's received honorary degrees from over 25 universities, including the University of Pittsburgh. And oh, by the way, she's the winner of a little insignificant award known as the Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, merely the nation's highest uh, civilian honor. Several years ago, the board of the Hesselbein Institute came to us and asked if we would partner with Frances to continue and extend her work to a wider audience. The Johnson Institute, they knew, was the ideal platform given our own track record of leadership, research, education, and training for both traditional students and executives around the world and community service here in Pittsburgh. So what are we doing with the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Forum in the Johnson Institute? Well, it's allowed us to launch several very important new initiatives. The first is an executive in residence program, and I see Professor Lindsay Anderson here who's leveraging her experience as a uh, senior administrator in the Federal Emergency Management Agency. She's serving in that role as well as directing our Center for um, Disaster Management. She's providing counsel to students on leadership development and career management, and she has also launched a, a podcast series on disaster management and leadership. It's an incredible program, and we're really, really delighted to have Lindsay with us. We also have with us Professor Julia Santucci. Julia is in the back of the room. Julia has started and, again, is leveraging her own experience in the CIA and the State Department to develop a special leadership program for students who are interested in international affairs and security studies. So she has designed and implemented this program for selected students who are interested in those careers, and it's off to a terrific start. Third, we're also privileged to now be um, the uh, publisher of a remarkable journal called Leader to Leader. This is a, an award-winning quarterly that attracts contributions from top leaders and uh, thought experts in their field and has a global audience of personal sus subscribers and institutional subscribers, including well-known names such as Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, the Harvard Business School, Mayo Clinic, New York Times, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and many, many others. So this is a privilege uh, to be uh, publishing that journal uh, with Gispias and Johnson Institute's um, partnership with the Hesselbein Forum. And in a shameless display of marketing, I've included some um, <laughs> slips out there. If you'd like to subscribe, we would be very, very happy to send you that, that journal. And then last but certainly not least, the Hesselbein Forum is allowing us to host a lecture series in her honor, uh, featuring people who have, in some cases, worked with her, as is the case today, uh, in some cases worked very closely with her, but in all cases um, exemplify the values uh, that Frances has lived by and managed by her entire life, values of inclusion, uh, values of empowerment, uh, and values of the highest standards of excellence in, in leadership. And we have a person with us today who is very, very eminently qualified to 
speak to all of those issues. Marshall Goldsmith, I suppose, can best be described as a author, thinker, speaker, uh, college professor. But that only begins to sort of describe the um, experiences he's had in each of those domains. Let me just read just very briefly a few of his remarkable accomplishments. The Harvard Business Review named Marshall the world's number one leadership thinker. The Institute for Management Studies gave Marshall its Lifetime Achievement Award for excellence in teaching. The American Management Association lists Marshall among the 50 great thinkers and leaders who have influenced the field merely over the past 80 years. So it's just a very small sample, Marshall, but I'm sure we're gonna work on that. Business Week named him among the 50 great leaders in America, Wall Street Journal, top 10 executive educators, The Economist, most credible executive advisor in the new era of business, and many, many others as we could go on. He's also a best-selling author. Um, he's written 36 books which have sold 2.5 million copies. Now, a number of us all day long uh, in academia, we're really happy if our books sell about 1,000 copies, right? <laughs> you know, I'm still getting the royalties from that. Now. Not, not like this, I can assure you. 2.5 million copies in 32 languages and they're bestsellers in 12 countries. Uh, he has three uh, New York Times bestsellers uh, right now, Triggers, Mojo, and What Got You Here Won't Get You There. The last of those three was the winner of the Harold Longman Award for Business Book of the Year. Now this is an interesting one. Amazon.com recognized the 100 best leadership and success books ever written, in the history of time, ever written, which includes classics as well as contemporary books, and Marshall has two books on that list. Um, and that, again, is an extraordinary achievement. Marshall is also a professor of management at the Dartmouth Tuck School of Business. He has his PhD from UCLA, um, their Anderson School of Management, He's also a distinguished alum there, and again, we've been teasing him. He's a distinguished alum at every one of the institutions he's attended, including kindergarten. So <laughs> I'm not gonna go on and on about the Indiana Business School and so on and so forth, but he's the distinguished alum is there Very as well. He's also done a great deal of charitable work, um, and he may speak to you today about a process he's involved in now that is kind of a pay it forward element of giving away much of his work, but he's done volunteer work um, both for the uh, Girl Scouts, uh, International Red Cross, for where he was named the National Volunteer of the Year. Uh, he's done work for the U.S. military, uh, Army, Navy, and others. And for those of you who are into social media and like to count your LinkedIn followers, um, Martin's got, or Marshall's got 900,000. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm anywhere close, Marshall, and nor will I ever be. But we are so delighted to have you with us today. Please help me join. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? I will briefly introduce myself, and we will begin. My name is Marshall. I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. I was a college professor and dean when I was very, very young. Then for the past 40 years, I've been doing a few things. One, I give talks or teach classes like today. So I travel all around the world speaking and teaching. I've been to exactly 100 countries. Vietnam was number 100. And on the American Airlines alone, I have over 11 million frequent flyer miles. <laughs> now, have any of you seen a movie before called Up in the Air with George Clooney? Have you seen the movie? I have the card. <laughs> and this always happens to me with the little card, especially with women. I show them the card. They always say the same thing. You look exactly like George Clooney. <laughs> so the first thing I do is speaking and teaching. This is what I enjoy the most. The second thing I do, which I'm most famous for, is I coach executives. So I've been the coach of the CEO of Ford and Pfizer and Glaxo and the President World Bank and Novartis and the Mayo Clinic and Walmart and on and on and on and on and on. What I love about coaching is coaching is where I learn everything. Now, in theory, I'm supposed to teach the people that I coach. In practice, I learn far more than I teach. I was Frances Hesselbein's coach when she was head of the Girl Scouts, which is kind of a joke, because she's the greatest leader in the world, so she really didn't need me to help her too much. 
yet uh, I get the privilege of learning from these people, which is a wonderful experience for me. Then the third thing is I do writing and editing. I have done 36 books, three bestsellers. The other three were purchased only by my mother, my father, and assorted <laughs> relatives. And, and then I, I give everything away online. All my material, you may copy, share, download, duplicate, use in church, charity, business, nonprofit, use anything, any way, any way that you want to. And my new project is I'm adopting people. And I have one of my adoptees right here. Now, we have a mic. Does this, does this mic work? Well, All right, very I'm, good. I'm working on a project where I, I went to a program called Design the Life You Love. And in the program, the woman said, who are your heroes? And my heroes included Francis Hesselbein and Richard Beckhardt and Peter Drucker and all these wonderful people. And they were all so kind and generous to me. So then she said, why don't you be like them? So I decided I'm going to adopt 15 people and teach them everything I know for free. And the only price is when they get old, they do the same thing. So I made a little selfie video and put it on LinkedIn. 30 second video, the most widely viewed video in the history of LinkedIn. 16,000 people applied. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful group of people. And tell them what it's like. OK, very good. Quick personal background. I'm actually a Pittsburgh native. Please hold your applause. <laughs> Grew up in New Kensington. And I went to IUP undergrad. My wife's a Pitt grad. And I'm a former professional bassist, actually. Right now, I'm a business educator, an author, and speaker, consultant, similar to what Marshall does um, in the realm of strategic leadership. But chapter one was I was a professional bass player. I used to play here every Saturday during pit games with Betty Badak. Oh. And I met my wife across the street. I was opening act for Tito Puente at the Pittsburgh <laughs> Latin Jazz Festival. My wife's Cuban and moved to Pittsburgh. Go figure. Anyhow, so that, that's my background. Anyhow, so I'm a really close friend of Frances Messelbein. So like Marshall, she's a dear friend and mentor. And about, I think, November 2016, Frances suggested that I submit an essay and apply to be one of uh, Marshall's protégés. Yeah. And I was selected to be a member. And uh, so far, I've had um, th two or three different gatherings with the group. So we've met in New York for a weekend. Uh, in December, we met at the World Bank with Dr. Jim Kim and Mark Teresic, the president or CEO of the Nature Conservancy. So let me tell you about the group. So I believe there's actually 109 of us, but that's Yeah, okay. yeah. Who's <laughs> counting, right? <laughs> but, 100 is a metaphorical yeah, term. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, for me, it's a game changer. It's a life-changing experience. I mean, it's a, it's a real gift. And, um, so when you look around the room, we have the CEO of Best Buy, we have executive coaches, um, I'm classified as strategy and culture. So a very eclectic group of people. We have designers, all, all sorts of different people, but they're all extremely high credentials, um, extremely high capability, extremely high character, but they also had extremely high desire to give back and make the world a better place. I think yeah. that's a unifying thread with our, yeah. with our group. So. Uh, we're just getting going. It's yeah. really more like an avalanche. It's just picking up every day. It gets bigger and bigger and new connections and all sorts of things. So uh, you'll be hearing more about it. It's, it's a very big deal for me. Yeah. And um, I'm just thankful to know Marshall and be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Now, if you want to send me an email, I love getting emails, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. I, if, I will apologize in advance. I can't promise to get back to you immediately. I always get back to people eventually. It just takes me a while sometimes. And also, I give everything away on my website, www.marshallgoldsmith.com. We've got about 200 videos, audios. It's all free. So use, copy, share, download, duplicate. Use it any way that you want to use it. My basic attitude is we're all going to be equally dead. So we might as, well, <laughs> might as well do a little good here. So if any of this stuff does any good for anybody, use it however you wish. Now, before he died, one other great privilege I had was spending 50 days with Peter Drucker. And I know Frieder, Peter Drucker because of Francis. Uh, he taught me so many things. Now, I got ranked number one leadership thinker. Hello. Let me choose this because we can't hear you as well. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me better? Wait a minute. Now you want me to try this one. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Now, there's one thing about me that I don't know if you know this. It's not on my bio. I left a good job in the city. <laughs> so can everybody hear me OK? Yeah. If you have any trouble hearing me, just wave your hand. I promise I won't sing anymore. OK. <laughs> I'm very bad. I have to, I'm going to get into your problems later. OK. <laughs> so Peter Drucker said, we spend a lot of time helping leaders learn what to do. We do not spend enough time helping leaders learn what to stop. He said, half the meters, leaders I meet, they don't need to learn what to do. They need to learn what to stop. 
Well, that one comment led to my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, and that's going to be our first goal, how to use what to stop in coaching. Uh, my little program is very experiential, so it's not just talking for the next hour. You're going to actually get up and do things. We're going to practice something called Feed Forward, and then I'm going to share a proven model you can use to develop yourself as a leader or develop yourself as a partner. Everything I teach you tonight works. It doesn't kind of work or sort of work or work only in this country or that country. It always works. The problem is not going to be understanding it. The problem is doing it. If you read my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, you read funny story after funny story after funny story. It's tempting to read that book and think, what a bunch of idiots. Well, how could those people be so dumb? Well, you've met many of those idiots, right? They have IQs of 150 and they're CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies. They are not dumb. They will tell you this stuff is very easy to understand. It's just very difficult to do. Now, we're going to practice something called peer coaching. An advantage of coming to a program like this is you get to meet new people. And what do I see? You're all sitting with people you already, you already know her, is that correct? You know this, this fellow. Yeah, use your son. We sit with people we already know. That's going to stop. You are going to stand up. You're going to look around the room. You're going to find one person you don't know, and you're going to sit next to that person. Stand up to your marks. Get set. Go, 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 go. Find a partner. OK, sit by your new partner. Sit. Sit by that new partner. Let's go. OK, sit by your partner. Sit, sit, sit. Sit, sit. Sit by your new partner. Sit. Okay, sit, 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 shh, quiet, 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 sit by your partner, sit, 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 shh, quiet, quiet, sit by that new partner, quiet, shh, shh, shh. We are now going to practice peer coaching. In peer coaching, you are not here to judge your partner. You are not here to critique your partner. You are not here to put your partner down. You are here to help your partner. I want you to shake hands with your partner and say, partner, my name is, I'm here to help. Go, shake hands with your partner, shake hands. <laughs> now, we are going to have, shh, 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 we are going to have an exercise program today. My exercise program is I am going to aimlessly wander around the room. Wander, 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 aimless wandering. Your exercise program is this. I never want this bad people in the front. Turn around here. I never want to see the back of your head. So you see, I wander around, wander, 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 and you turn. That's your exercise, excuse me. You turn so I don't see the back of your head. Okay, now, let us begin. I was interviewed in the Harvard Business Review and asked a question. What is the number one problem of all the successful people you have worked with over the years? What is their number one problem? And yes, as I look around the room, as I, as I look into your eyes, I <coughs> sense the problem in this very room. Yes, I feel many of you may be afflicted with this disease. Uh, my, my friend, the pilot there, certain affliction in your case. I, 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 I've worked with your kind before, yes. I, <laughs> What was my answer to the number one problem? Winning too much. Now what does that mean? If it's important, we want to win. If it's meaningful, we want to win. If it's critical, we want to win. If it's trivial, we want to win. If it's not worth it, we want to win anyway. Winners love winning. In the game of life, you're all winners. If you weren't winners, you wouldn't be sitting here. It is incredibly difficult for winners not to constantly win. I'm now going to give you a case study of winning too much that almost all of my clients fail. I will make a prediction. Almost all of you will fail this case study. And when I say fail, you will fail yourself. You will say what I did do is the opposite of what I know I should have done. Here is case study number one. Case study number one, you want to go to dinner at restaurant X. Your wife, husband, or partner wants to go to dinner at restaurant Y. You have a heated argument. You go to restaurant Y. It was not your choice. The food tastes awful, and the service is terrible. Option A, critique the food. Point out our partner was wrong. This mistake could have been avoided had only you listened to me, me, me. Option B, shut up. 
eat the stupid food. <laughs> Try to enjoy it and have a nice evening. What would I do? What should I do? Almost all my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. What should I do? Shut up. Please raise your hands. How many people in the room have ever critiqued the food before? Hands in the air. Yes, a room filled with food critiquers. Food critiquers. Was that smart or stupid? Stupid. stupid. Very stupid. And as stupid as it was, it was stupid. I'm going to give you an example now that is so hideously stupid, it will make that one pale by comparison. And I will predict half of you have done this. Case study two. You have a hard day at work, a hard day, under so much pressure, push, 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 more, 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 such a hard day. You go home, your husband, wife, friend, or partner is there, and the other person says, I had such a hard day today, I had such a tough day. And we reply, you had a hard day. You had a hard day. Do you have any idea what I had to put up with today? Do you think you had a hard day? We are so competitive, we have to prove we are more miserable than the people we live with. <laughs> I gave this example to my class at the Dartmouth Tuck School. A young man in the back raised his hand. He said, I did that last week. I asked him, what happened? He said, my wife looked at me. She said, honey, you just think you've had a hard day. It is not over. <laughs> <laughs> now, in my book, Triggers, I tell a story of an email that a young man sent to me. If any of you would send me such an email after today, I would be proud of today. A young man sent me an email and he said, I know you do not remember me. I was in your class five years. I just want to send you an email today and say thank you. He said, yesterday my wife was having a terrible day. She, I was under all kinds of pressure at work and behind schedule. She called me up. She was talking. I was just getting ready to point out how her problems paled in significance to my own. He said, for some reason I remembered your little course and I started breathing. And I thought, this is my wife. This is someone I love. This is not the enemy. I just listened to my wife and I said, I love you. Thank you for everything you've done for the family. I went home, spent $25. I bought her some flowers. I gave her the flowers. And I said, I love you. He said, that was the best $25 I have ever spent. Thank you very much. Well, the next time you get into that, let me win. Let me prove I'm right. Let me point out how smart I am. Take a deep breath and ask a question. What am I winning? What am I winning here? Talk to your partner 20 seconds and answer this question. When is one time in the past few years that you had a need to win and prove you were right and you should not have been fighting that battle in the first place? Go, talk to your partner. Talk, 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 talk. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop, stop. Second classic problem of smart, successful people is called Adding too much value. Adding too much value. What does that mean? I'm young, smart, enthusiastic. You're my boss. I come to you with an idea. You think it is a great idea. Rather than just saying great idea, our natural tendency is to say, that is a nice idea. Why don't you add this to it? The problem is the quality of the idea may go up 5%. My commitment to execute the idea may go down 50%. It's now not my idea, boss. Now it's your idea. Incredibly difficult for smart, successful people not to constantly go through life adding value. One of my good coaching clients retired a few years ago. His name, J.P. Garnier. J.P. was the CEO of a very large drug company, GlaxoSmithKline. I asked J.P., what did you learn about leadership as the CEO of this huge company? And every time you get promoted in life, this lesson will become more real for you. He said, my suggestions become orders. My suggestions become orders. Now he said, if they're smart, they're orders. If they're stupid, they are orders. If I want them to be orders, they are orders. And if I do not want them to be orders, they are orders anyway. For nine years, you'll appreciate this, I trained the admirals in our fine United States Navy. What is the first thing I always teach those new admirals? When you get that little star, your suggestions become orders. Do admirals make suggestions? That admiral makes a suggestion. What is the response? Sir, yes, sir. That suggestion becomes an order. 
I asked my friend JP, what'd you learn about leadership for me? He said, you taught me one lesson to help me be a better leader and have a happier life. I asked him, what was that one lesson? He said, before I speak, stop and breathe. Breathe and ask myself one question, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And he said, as the CEO of this huge company, 50% of the time I've had the discipline to stop and to breathe and to ask myself, is it worth it? What did I decide? Am I right? Maybe. Is it worth it? No. Okay, everyone look up here. I want everyone to smile, smile. I want everyone to take a deep breath do your hand like this and go, ah, oh, hand, hand, ah, oh, hand, ah, oh, oh, oh. very good. Now I want you to think back to the last time you got angry, angry, and got into a heated argument with someone you love, when you had a need to win and prove that they were wrong on a minor or insignificant point. Have any of us, of us ever done that before? Yeah. Was it worth it? Do any of you have teenage children? Teenagers, raise your hand. Teenagers, come on, hands in the air. Teenagers, yeah, many teenagers. I have a question. Have we ever attempted to prove that teenage child was wrong on a minor or insignificant point? Have we attempted that before, Mom? Uh, and I learned quickly not to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how's that work out for you? No, 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 no. Win the big stuff. All that little stuff, take a deep breath and let it go. Let it go, let it go. Now, more good news. Everything I teach you does not just apply at work. It all applies at home. And at the end of the day, the people at home are even more important than the people at work. I'm now gonna give you four words that help you be a better coach at work and a better family member at home. Four words that apply to almost all of us. What are these four simple words? Help more, judge less. Help more, judge less. How many of us have friends and family members that might be happy if we help just a tad more and we judge just a little less. Yeah. Would any of them object to these changes? No. What's your first name, sir? David. David. What are the odds a year from today they're going to come back and say, you know, David, we miss the judgmental you. <laughs> 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 Highly unlikely this will be a problem for any of us. Now, you're going to learning from a great leader. In my role as an executive coach, I have a very unique billing system. I do not charge my clients one cent if they don't get better. I work with them for a year and a half, they get better, I get paid. They don't get better, it's all free. Better is not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking around up there in the front, 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 around. Better is not judged by me. Better is not judged by my client. Better is judged by everyone around my client. Now there's a great way to test if someone believes what they're saying. You can ask a person one simple question, one question, and instantly determine their level of belief. I have never seen this simple question fail. What is the simple question? Do you want to bet on it? Do you want to bet on it? Now, if they say, I believe it, but I wouldn't bet on it, what did you just learn? They don't believe it. They say, here's the check, what do you learn? They believe it. I bet on this every time. When you get paid for results, you learn humility. The client I coached that I spent the most amount of time with did not improve at all, and I did not get paid. The client I coached that I spent the least amount of time with improved more than anyone I've ever coached. 200 people got better, and I did get paid. This was a humbling lesson. Do any of you have a background in engineering or mathematics? Maybe mathematics, yeah. you'll appreciate this. I made a chart, chart. On one dimension, it was called time spent with Marshall Goldsmith. The other dimension was called improvement. There was a clear negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. Well, I thought this is a troubling chart. I go talk to my client who improved the most, who I spent the least amount of time with, who was ranked in 2014 as the number three greatest leader in the entire world, behind only the Pope and Angela Merkel, CEO of the year in the United States. His name is Alan Mulholly. Alan was the CEO of Ford. When he was there, the stock went from $1 to $18.40. When he left Ford, he was personally paid $400 million. This is a union company. Do union employees usually love CEOs? How about that UAW? They usually love CEOs? No. How about CEOs that make 400 million bucks? They love them? They loved him. When he left Ford, they knew he was a CEO. They knew he made $400 million. He had a 97% approval rating from every employee in a union company. They love that guy. He saved the company. 
not only a great leader, he's just a great human being. He loves Frances too, by the way, loves her. Well, I go talk to my friend Alan. I said, Alan, of all the people I coached, I spent the least amount of time with you and you improved the most. I showed Alan my chart, <laughs> chart. I said, Alan, the way this troubling chart looks, had you never met me, you would really be good. <laughs> So I asked him, what should I learn about coaching from you? Now, he taught me two lessons. If you don't learn anything else but tonight but these two lessons, you're going to be a better coach and have a happier life. He said, lesson number one, Marshall, your biggest challenge as a coach is called customer selection. You pick the right customer, you win. You pick the wrong customer, you lose. He said, number two, never make the coaching process about yourself and your own ego and how smart you think you are. Make it about those great people you work with and how hard they work and how proud you are of them. Then he said to the CEO of Ford, my job wasn't that different. He said, I don't design cars. I don't build cars. I don't sell cars. I got to have great people. And he said, every day I drove to work, I told myself, leadership is not about me. Leadership is about them. Well, for that great individual achiever, it's all about me. And everyone in this room is probably a pretty great achiever or you would not be sitting here. That doesn't mean you're going to be a great leader. There's a big difference between I'm a great achiever and I'm a great leader. What's the difference? That's the difference between all about me and all about them. Most of us never deeply understand the point about customers. Let me illustrate the point. I have a question. Is this a group of high character, ethics, and integrity? What do you think, yes or no? He says yes. I'm going to test that right now. I'm going to ask the group a question, a troublesome question, a personal question. Yes, perhaps even an embarrassing question. If the answer is yes, you must raise your hands. Are you ready? <laughs> How many people in this very room are still stupidly attempting to change the behavior of a husband, wife, partner, or significant other who has no interest in changing? Come on, get these hands up. Hands in the air. Yes, I see. Hands in the air. Look at this. He raised his hand. My host, how many years have you been engaged in this foolish partner-changing crusade? Give me a number here. I've got to be really careful with this one because she's sitting real close by. <laughs> so, I think you should pick on somebody else on this one. <laughs> Look over here. Ah, okay. Who, keep the hands up. Who's trying to change that partner? Sir, how many years have you been doing this? Ten, Ten wasted years. Look up here. Ah. Now I have another, a second question, another troublesome question, personal, perhaps embarrassing. How many of people in this room are still even more stupidly attempting to change the behavior of mommy or daddy who has no interest in changing? Come on. Oh, look at all this parental, oh, mommy and daddy, mommy or both? Uh, both and mommy. Mommy. <laughs> now, how many years have you been attempting to change poor mommy? 40, look up here. Ah, ah. I, I was teaching my class at Dartmouth. The woman raised her hand. I said, are you attempting to change mommy or daddy? She said, daddy. I said, what is daddy's problem? She said, he does not have a healthy lifestyle. I asked her, how old is daddy? She said, 94 years old. <laughs> Leave the old boy alone. You want to smoke a cigar, old man? Smoke too. Smoke pot, who cares? He's 94 years old. <laughs> well, I'm now gonna teach you a great lesson that's gonna help you be a better coach and have a happier life. In terms of coaching adults, if they do not care, do not waste your time. If they do not care, do not waste your time. I just did the Inc. 5000 conference and Michael Dell was the speaker before me. He had a great quote, you know what he said? Pay them to leave. Pay them to leave. It's not worth it. Yeah, a great point for developing yourself as a friend, leader, partner. If you do not care, do not waste your time. If you're going to get better at anything, the motivation for your improvement is going to come from one and only one place. Where's that? In your heart. If it doesn't come from in here, you won't do it anyway. Look at the people I coach. I cannot make them change what they do not want to change. What am I supposed to do? Shoot them? Beat them up? Kill them? I cannot make them change what they do not want to change. I can help them change what they do want to change. I can't make you change what you don't want to change. You don't want to change something, you're going to change it anyway. I'm not here to judge you. I can help you change what you do want to change. That's good enough. Now, we're going to practice that right now. I'm going to have everybody in the room pick one thing to improve. Not 30, not 50, not 100, just one. 
You know, if you get better at this one thing, it's going to make a positive difference in your life. And as I've grown older, I don't even care how it makes a positive difference. Any old positive difference is good. I was teaching at UBS, a very large Swiss bank. A woman came to my class and two years later came to my class again. I asked her, what'd you change? She said, to be honest at UBS, I didn't change anything. She said, I am a better mother. I said, good enough for me. Let's say you become a better mother, better father, better friend, better boss, better team member, better anything. It's all good. Let's just get better at something. Now, I'm going to give you some thought starters so you hadn't thought of anything yet. You want to change? Who in the room, please raise your hand, is impatient. Who's impatient? Oh, well, my friend over here, the pilot. He is so impatient, he was the first one to raise his hand on the impatient. <laughs> Now, I, I have a question. Would your friends and family members be sad if you became more patient or happy? What do you Much think? Happier. Much happier. We're, we're going with happy on that one. Uh, one night I had dinner with General Eric Shinseki. He was head of the U.S. Army, four-star general. We were surrounded by two to four-star generals. So he looks at me and says, Marshall, who is your favorite customer? I said, sir, my favorite customer, smart, dedicated, hard working, driven to achieve, creative, entrepreneurial, cares about the company and customers, great values, high integrity, gets results and is a stubborn, opinionated know-it-all that never wants to be wrong. I said, sir, do you think any of the generals in this very room may fit such a description? He said, Marshall, we have a target-rich opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> now let me ask you a question. How many of you all in this very room are a little bit stubborn or opinionated? Let's raise our hand, a little stubborn, a little bit, yeah. And if we're stubborn at work, do we become excessively open-minded when we go home? <laughs> no, no, this only gets worse when we go home. Let's take another one. Who needs to listen better? Listen, raise your hand. Listen. Now, let's say you get better at listening. What happens to your score in treating people with respect, up or down? Up. Treat people with respect. Up. Coaching. Up. Friend and family member. See, the way you get better at everything is don't try to change everything. None of us are going to change everything anyway. Let's just pick one thing that's important to get better at that. That's good enough. Now, you're going to talk to your partner. You pick anything you want to pick. It doesn't matter. Here's the rule. So it has to come from your heart, and you have to believe it's important. You say, good partner, here's one thing I want to get better at, and here's why it's important to me. Your partner says, here's one thing I want to get better at, here's why it's important to me. You all understand the rules? I forgot something. Look up here. Look up here. I forgot something. If you cannot think of even one thing that you do need to improve, pick humility. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to your marks, get set, talk to your partner. Go, 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 go. Talk. Okay, stop. Stop, stop, stop. Shh, shh, shh. We are now going to practice something called feed forward. Now, I love feed forward. Very positive, upbeat way to help yourself and other people get better. It's kind of the centerpiece of my whole philosophy of coaching and leadership development. Feed forward. Now, in feed forward, you're going to be in two roles. Role number one is called learn as much as I can. Now, I have a question. If the answer is yes, I want you to say yes when I do my hand like this. Are there smart people in this room? Yes. Question two. If you had a chance to learn something from these smart people, would you like to do that? Yes. Next question. Are there nice people in this room? Yes. If you had a chance to help these nice people, would you like to help them? Yes. You're either helping these nice people, which is good, or learning from these smart people, which is good, so therefore it is all... Good. What are the rules of feed forward? Rule number one is no feedback about the past. No feedback about the past. We spend too much time in our lives chattering about the past. 
Have any of you been impressed with your wife, husband, or partner's near photographic memory of your previous sins, <laughs> which have been documented and will be shared with us in a repetitive and annoying way? Well, oh, she's looking at you now. <laughs> I didn't even want to look at her. <laughs> well, you know what? We cannot change the past anyway. Whatever we did in the past is over. Now, everyone look up here. Look up here. Do your hands like this. Hands. Hands. Look at all the good faces in the room. Look at all these nice faces. Look back up here. Smile and go, ah. You see, whatever sins anyone in this room has committed, we can't fix them anyway. Rule one, no feedback about the past. Rule two is harder. You can't judge or critique ideas. When people give you ideas, you cannot say good idea, bad idea. I already knew that. That will never work. No matter what people tell you, you are to stand there. Shut up. Listen. Take notes. And all you can say back is thank you. Thank you. Now, this is a Buddhist exercise. Buddha said, only do what I teach if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, it's OK. Just don't do it. Well, in the exercise, you ask a person for ideas. I treat the idea like a gift. Now, if she gives me a gift, should I say, stinky gift, <laughs> bad gift. I don't like your stupid gift. What should we say to a nice person who gives us a gift? Thank you. If you want to use the gift, use it. If you do not wish to use the gift, put it in the closet. If you already have the gift, repackage it and give it to your mother-in-law. Who cares? <laughs> Just say thank you. So you're going to say, oh, by the way, speaking of which, where are, you have the comic books? Yeah, they're there. In where? The, oh, here they are. Perfect. Now, this is going to be a prize-winning opportunity. You're going to talk to as many people as you can possibly talk to in the next four minutes. You're going to say, my name is, I want to get better at. Positive, simple, focused, and fast. The person's going to give you one or two very quick ideas for the future. I know feedback about the past. What if the person gives you the dumbest idea in the world? What do you say back? You just say thank you. The other person says, my name is, I want to get better at. Thank you. You shake hands and go talk to someone else. Whoever talks to the most people in the next four minutes is going to win the valuable prize. You're, and by the way, after you shake hands, raise your right hand. That's their signal you don't have a partner. So then they look around, they see your hand is up, and they rush over and they talk to you. Now, this is a valuable prize. This prize is particularly good for those of us with limited attention spans, you see. This prize is what got you here won't get you there, the comic book version. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of pictures, not too many words. So you all understand the rule. My name is I want to get better at. So from here to there, you go to this part of the room. From here on over, you go toward the middle. From here, uh, there. I'll see people board the back part, you go toward the back. People toward the front half, you go over this way. Don't start with your partner. Stand up <laughs> to your marks, get set. Go, 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 go. Stop. <laughs> Stay where you are. Stop. Stay where you are. Stop, stop, stop. Now, everyone, look up here. I'm going to begin a sentence. I'm going to leave out the last word. Do not say anything. You will think of a word. Don't say anything until I go like this. When I go like this, you're going to loudly shout out that word, whatever that word is in your mind. Are we ready? This little exercise was <laughs> great, positive, useful, helpful. People say nice words. One of the more common words I hear is the word fun. What's the last word you think to describe any feedback activity? Fun. Has anyone ever called you in the office and said, please come into my office. I have feedback I would like to share with you. And you said, fun, fun, fun. Fun is the last word you think of. Yet I've done this exercise with hundreds of thousands of people from around the world. I did it in Moscow last month, 17,000 people I did this exercise. 95% say it's positive, useful, helpful, or even fun. The answer to this question will help you be a better coach and have a happier life. Why? Remain standing, join a group of three, four, or five people. If there's six, two groups of three. Go, three, four, five, three, four, five. Go, 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 three, four, five. Okay, stop. Stop! Shh, shh, stop, 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 stop. Shh, 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 stop. Raise your right hand in the air. Point your right index finger at the ceiling. Point! 
When I count to three, point to the spokesperson in your little group. One, two, three, point! <laughs> okay, stop. You now have 30 seconds. Come up with as many reasons as you can. Why do 95% of the people say the exercise is positive, useful, helpful, or even fun, no matter what country I'm in? Why? Give me a list of reasons. Talk. Why, 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 why? Okay, stop. Shh, shh, stop. Now, when I wander over to your group, one comment per group, and please speak. You have to be very close to the mic, so please speak right into the mic. Who's the spokesperson? One comment. Human interaction. Human interaction. Two ways, not one way. You come to me and say, I want to get better at X. Please help me. I say, I can get better too. Please help me. You see how different that feels? Than one person going, you get better, you get better. By the way, I have nothing to improve. Let's just fix you today. Well, that's a very different kind of message. Who's the spokesperson? Okay, one reason. Speed dating. Speed dating. It's fast. <laughs> one thing we do wrong in coaching is we talk too much. I give you my best idea. Let's talk some more. Now you get my second best idea. Let's talk for an hour. Now you get my 75th best idea. What happens to the quality of our ideas as we keep babbling? They get worse and worse and worse. People do not remember your first good idea. They remember your last stupid idea. Who's the spokesperson? You are, okay. Uh, smiling. You're smiling, yes. It's, it's not negative. It's focused on a positive future you can change, not a negative past you can't change anyway. Everyone look up here. How many of us have ever made fools of ourselves in front of important people before? Have we ever done that? And by the way, how much fun is it to relive that fool-making moment? No, that, that's not so much fun. Who's the spokesperson? Okay, why? Uh, verbalizing problems helps you solve them. Verbalizing a problem helps you solve it. And you got to pick whatever you wanted. Nobody made you pick anything. Just pick whatever you want. Well, you know what? If you pick it, you own it. If someone else picks it, they own it. When you coach people, the more what they're trying to prove comes from inside them and not inside you as a coach, the better off. Who's the spokesperson? Who? Oh, okay, one reason. Why? No judgment. No judging. If I would have allowed you to judge or critique each other's comments, you would have spent twice as much time debating the value of the comments as listening to the comments. How much do I learn proving I'm right? Nothing. How much do I learn proving you're wrong? Nothing. What percent of all interpersonal communication time is wasted on that, according to hundreds of thousands of people? 65%. Cut that out, life is much more productive and much more positive. One gentleman said, I listen better in this exercise than I almost ever listen in my life. I asked him why. He said, normally when other people talk to me, I am so busy composing my next comment to prove how smart I am, I'm not listening, I'm composing. He said, it's amazing how much better I could listen when I knew I just had to say thank you. The irony, he had a Nobel Prize. A man with a Nobel Prize in a management class trying to prove he was smart. I said, you have one Nobel Prize, you might not win two, it's okay. <laughs> Let's just be declaring victory here. A common misconception of coaching is this. I must be superior to you or better than you to help you, or you must be superior to me or smarter than me to help me. Wrong. How many of you near the end of the exercise began, the need to, began to feel the need to say to others in this room, I have your problem too. 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 How different were everyone else's problems? It doesn't matter what country I'm in. I've been to Saudi Arabia five times in the last two years. Their culture is different. This exercise is all the same. Even though our cultures are different, we're not that different in here. We don't have to be better than others to help others. Better off not trying to be superior. Better off being a fellow human being, stumbling through life, without clear answers to even tiny little questions such as, who am I? Where are we? And what is going on here? That's all we are anyway. We're not little gods. We're just little confused people stumbling around. Much better off to just be that. 
And did any of you near the end of the exercise begin to hear in the back of your mind a little voice, a small voice, a faint voice going, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. You know all of those brilliant ideas that you keep giving to the other people? Why don't you do any of them yourself? Some of us heard that little voice. I don't have to be better than you to help you. Let's just be two people and try to help each other. And finally, what do you say to all the nice people in the room just helped you? Thank you, thank you. Now look around the room and count. How many people did you talk to, roughly? Give me a number. I think maybe eight. <laughs> okay, we have a. Eight, she had eight. You have a six. Yes, we have an eight. How many? A ten. Do I have any more than ten? How many? Twelve. Do I have any more than twelve? Let's hear it for the champion. Twelve. <laughs> and let me get book, book, book for you. And a question, what were you trying to improve? Uh, Work-life balance. There you go, very good. And finally, and finally, a big round of applause for all the nice people. Just help you, a big round of applause. Yes. <laughs> go back and sit by your partner. Go back and sit by your partner. Okay, now how do we use all these good things to develop ourselves as leaders, as partners? Step one, get in the habit of doing something in life we don't do enough, asking a question. What is this simple question? How can I be a better? How can I be a better? Well, we don't ask this question much in life. Now, we're going to practice something called a participant response activity again. I'm going to ask you questions. Do not reply until I go like this. If the answer is yes, when I go like this, you say yes in a very loud and assertive voice. If the answer is no, remain silent. If you don't know, remain silent. You all understand the rules. Do you believe that customer satisfaction is important? Yes. yes. And should companies encourage their customers to provide input? Yes. Should we listen to our good customers? Yes. Learn from these fine people. Yes. Get better based on what we learn. Yes. Do you have a husband, wife, or partner at home? Yes. <laughs> have you spent a lot of time at home asking your partner what can I do to be a better partner in our relationship? Yes. <laughs> now, I noticed a massive dip in that level of enthusiasm. Tell the truth. Who has a husband, wife, or partner at home, and you have not been asking that good partner, what can I do to be a better partner? Come on, get hands up. Come on, hands in the air. Guilty, guilt. look at this. Guilty, guilty, guilty. What is your name, sir? Conrad. Now, do you have a husband, wife, or partner at home? Wife. Your wife. What's your wife's name? Carol. Carol, the bad Conrad. <laughs> Conrad, you're going to go home tonight and talk to Carol. You're going to ask Carol a question. What can I, Conrad, do to be a better partner in our relationship? Then Carol will ask you a question. Who have you been sleeping with? <laughs> Now, you see, we do not ask this question at work, and at home, we ask it less. Would you agree? Have you been asking, what can you do to be better? Well, that's good. Now, would you agree we should be asking this question at home to those people we love? Well, what do you think? Should we be doing that? And when are we going to start? When are we going to start doing that? Next week. Next week? <laughs> 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 That's the wrong answer. When should we do this? I've got a better answer. Now, it's time to get out your cell phone and send a little text message. I want everyone to get out your cell phone right now. And you're going to send a text message. Now, you're going to send a text message to your husband, wife, or partner. If you don't have one, send it to a relative or friend. And you're going to send one message. And that message is going to be, what can I do to be a better partner in our relationship? Now, come on, work up that courage there, Lieutenant Colonel. Come on, you can do this now. What can I do to be a better partner in our relationship with no explanation? What can I do to be a better partner? 
Now, while you're sending your messages, I've done this with thousands of people. I get hilarious responses. Let me give you some of my favorites. The typical wife reaction is this. This is your wife. Who is the message intended for? <laughs> I get a lot of, are you drunk? <laughs> are you stoned? <laughs> Young man at Microsoft raised his hand. He said, my wife has already sent me nine numbered suggestions. All of a sudden we hear, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> 17 suggestions on how he could be a better husband. <laughs> so I get some fantastic responses to this one. So. Send those text messages. If you have a funny one you'd like to read to everyone, let me know. But I, I do get some hilarious, hilarious responses. Now, when my daughter Kelly was 11 and my son Brian was 9, I decided I ought to be asking my children a question. What can I do to be a better parent? You see, if it's worthwhile to say, what can I do to be a better boss, what's more important? What can I do to be a better father? Problem with asking a question is, you get the answer. My daughter Kelly was 11. She said, Daddy, you travel a lot. She said, Daddy, that's not what bothers me. What bothers me is the way you act when you come home. You talk on the phone, you watch sports, you don't spend much time with me. And she said, one time it was Saturday, and I wanted to go to a party at my friend's house, and Mommy did not let me go to the party. I had to stay home and spend time with you. And then she said, you spent no time with me. That was not right. What could I say? Thank you. I said, Daddy's going to do better. I said, I'm going to keep track of how many days I can spend four hours with my family. 1991, 92 days. 1992, 110. 1993, 131. 1994, 135. I made more money the year I spent four hours, you know, undistracted time with my family than the year I spent 20. Yeah, I spent almost no time with my family. 20 days versus 135. I made more money when I spent 135 days. What did I learn? The San Diego Chargers American football team don't really care about me. <laughs> I learned a terrible lesson last year. The San Diego Chargers American football team, they don't care about San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> now it's January 1, 1995. Daddy's proud. Both kids are now teenagers. I've got my charts. I said, kids, look, 135 days, four hours with Daddy. What goal this year? How about 150 days? They both go, no, Daddy, no. <laughs> no you have overachieved. <laughs> my son said 50 is a better target. They both voted for a massive cutback of old dad. Yes, Colonel, what do we got here? Well, I, we have a comment. I, I followed your suggestion. And I got back, excuse me, question mark? <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. Uh, I get the feeling that lovely partner's not used to asking. No, 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 this is good. Now, she maybe says that because she thinks you have nothing to improve. We don't want to bet on that one, do we? I don't think so. No. <laughs> you got something here? I got the same. What? Uh, what? Question what? <laughs> 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 what question mark? Well, again, there seems to be a lot of shock out there. A lot of shock from various partners. Oh, wait a minute, we got another one. Okay, well, tell me. I can't see it. What does it say? What? What do you mean? What time are you done? Pick you up where? <laughs> <laughs> this fellow's used to taking orders, you can tell. <laughs> you got one? Just a second. Are you sure that text was meant for me? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're getting a lot of revealing responses here. Now, I was teaching this class for a company called the Kaiser Permanente Company, a very large hospital company, 1,000 people in the room. A woman raised her hand named Trudy Treiner. She said, I've been to your class twice. I've read everything you've ever written. There's always something you've left out. She said, please ask people to do this with their parents. Please ask people to do this with their parents. She said, you know, I, I went to your class and my daughter was 17. And I asked my daughter, how could I be a better mother? And we had such a nice talk. And then my daughter asked me, how can I be a better daughter? She thought, well, that was so nice. I should talk to my mother. 
She said, I called my mother and I asked my mother, what can I do to be a better daughter? She said, my mother said, daddy's dead. I live alone in the country. Every day I take a long walk up the road to go to my mailbox. And almost every day there's nothing in my mailbox. Every day that makes me so lonely. She said, as your mother, it would mean so much to me if you would just send me a little picture or a little card or something so when I would walk to my mailbox, there would be something in my mailbox. She started sending her mother little pictures and cards every day. What did that cost her? Nothing. What did that mean to her mother? Everything. She sent me an email a couple of years later, and the email said my mother just died. The last thing her mother told her before she died, thank you for doing that. Thank you. Now, if your parents are alive, this is a very nice thing to do for three reasons. Number one, it's good for them. Even if they say you don't have anything to improve, you'll be proud that you cared enough to ask. Number two, it's good for you. What's the number one regret children have when mom and dad die? Why didn't I thank them for all the nice things they did to help me? Why was I judging them all the time? And number three, if you have little children, it's very good for your little children. Why is it good for your little children? You know those old people you're calling up on the telephone? Guess what? You're gonna be those old people. You want that kid calling you up on the telephone? Your little child is not going to listen to what you say. Your little child is going to watch what you do. Our values are not what we say. Our values are what we do. Talk to your partner 20 seconds and answer this question. Who is one person you should be asking this question? How can I be better too? And why is that important to you? Go, talk to your partner. Talk, talk, talk. this question to? Who's a good one for you? My partner had a good answer. What is it? I hadn't gotten to my... Um, What's yours? I don't know. Um, my stepfather. My very nice. just died. Very tough, so. yeah. That's good. You won't ever regret that. You won't regret that. It's more important than all this business stuff. How about you? And my father just died. Yeah. I've been spending a lot of time with my mother. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, all the more important than all of this stuff. End of the day. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Shh, shh, shh. Now, after we asked for input, the next step, the first thing we want to do is the last thing we should do. What's that? Ask for input, then express my opinion. If I ask you for input and immediately start expressing my opinion, what does that sound like? Defensiveness, denial, rationalization, and making excuses. Fight that incredible urge to make excuses and just listen. Now, who is the greatest leader I've ever met in my life, and I've met many great leaders, is our friend Francis Hesselbein. Now, I love Francis. Uh, again, 25 honorary PhDs, editor of an academic journal. You can go on and on. She's pretty, and she still works out, and she's 102 years old. She's an amazing woman, just amazing. Well, she does one thing before she talks that almost none of us do. What is this strange thing she tends to do before speaking? Think. What do most of us do when we get input? Blah, 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 blah. What do most of us do when we get angry? Blah, blah, blah. What does she do? She just breathe and think not only what am I going to say, how am I going to say it? Great quote from Francis, why should I control anything else if I cannot even be entrusted to control myself? Why should I be entrusted to control anything else if I cannot even be entrusted to control myself? Another great quote, the second I lose control, where's the problem? The second I lose control, the problem is no longer out there. The second I lose control, the problem is now right here. Easy theory, difficult practice. Years ago, I was in a Vietnamese Buddhist monastery with a Buddhist monk called Thich Nhat Thanh. Have any of you ever read anything before from Thich Nhat Thanh? Brilliant, wonderful guy. I was at Plum Village, his monastery, for a week. One day we meditated on anger. 
He said, think to a time in your life when you became angry and lost control of your behavior, we will analyze who was responsible for what happened. I came up with a case study involving my daughter, Kelly. I'm very proud of my daughter, Kelly. Some of you may have seen her before. Kelly is a graduate of Duke University and was on the American TV show Survivor Africa. So if you saw the third season of Survivor, she was a little survivor. She worked with Mark Burnett, the famous reality TV producer, for two years. She did casting for Survivor, The Amazing Race. Then she went back, got a PhD at uh, Yale University, and now she has tenure at Vanderbilt. She's a senior professor at Vanderbilt, so Daddy's very proud. When she was 14, not so good. <laughs> Do any of you have teenage daughters? There is hope. <laughs> they sometimes get better. Yeah, my daughter was terrible. She was the first girl in her class to acquire a large and brightly colored navel ring. Now, there's no use having a navel ring if no one can see that navel ring. So she got a sleazy outfit to highlight that navel <laughs> ring. Fortunately, the obscene tattoos turned out to be temporary tattoos, but Daddy comes home and sees the navel ring, the obscene tattoos, and that sleazy outfit. I reacted with something less than wild enthusiasm. <laughs> Yelling, screaming, ranting, raving. In my little monastery, I meditated upon that event, and I thought, what was I thinking? My first thought, her walking down the street and somebody saying, what a cheap looking kid. I wonder who her father is. <laughs> Second thought, even worse, my own friends. I'm amazed Marshall lets his daughter look this way. Who was I concerned about here? You. Yeah, where's the bigger issue, her navel ring or my ego? If I had to do it over, I would have still said get rid of the navel ring. I didn't have to yell and scream and act like a moron. It's very difficult when we get angry to realize, where's the problem? Ask, listen, think, thank. Now the next thing is thank people. Thank people and don't punish the messenger. Now we're gonna practice another one of those yes exercises. Now, Conrad, is that correct? We didn't do real good on the last one, did we? Not so good, no. But we're gonna give you a second chance, though. So. You're all getting a second chance at another one of these yes ones, and I, I hate to say it, but I'm predicting even more pathetic results on round number two. I'm gonna give you all a chance, so are you ready? If that answer is yes, you say yes. If that answer is no, you remain silent. When you work in a large organization, would you agree with me your coworkers are important? Yes. Now, should we ask them for their ideas? Yes. Encourage them to tell the honest truth? Yes. And would you agree with me that punishing the messenger, punishing those good people trying to help us, punishing those that tell the truth, that would be a bad idea, yes. a terrible idea, yes. an awful idea. Yes. Am I in a room surrounded by hypocrites? <laughs> <laughs> now you told me punishing the messenger was a bad idea. I heard it. Terrible idea, awful idea. I'm now gonna give you a case study of punishing the messenger. This is a case study that almost all my clients fail. I'm gonna predict many of you will fail this. I, I have worked with many pilots in the military so far, and I, I will say so far, there's been a 100% failure rate on this case study. <laughs> we'll see how you do. Maybe you'll do better than the others. Are we ready for the case study? You have a hard day at work, a hard day. You go home, your husband, wife, friend, or partner's there. You get in the car to go to the store. You're driving to the store. Lots of traffic. Cars are cutting in front of you. People are honking their horns. That person in the front seat goes, look out, there's a red light up ahead. Did you say, thank you? or perhaps something that sounded a little more like, what do you mean there's a red light ahead? Don't you think I can see? I know how to drive this car. Why don't you be quiet and let me drive? How many of us have ever chosen plan B and yelled at that person in the front seat? Get these hands up. Now I'm very confused. What was the cost of that person saying, hey, there's a red, what did that cost anybody? Nothing, what might that have saved? What might that have saved? Your life, their life, and the lives of other innocent people. If someone gives us something that has a fantastic potential benefit and costs absolutely zero, what should we say to this good person? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Look up here, the next time you're driving, and that person corrects your driving, you're gonna go just like this. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Talk to your partner 20 seconds and answer this question. Why do we scream at that person in the front seat 
instead of just saying thank you. Go talk to your partner. What do we yell for? Talk, talk, talk. <laughs> And by the way, pilot, zero. Yeah, yeah fighter pilot, zero. What are the odds of fighter pilot is going to listen? <laughs> now, by the way, have you pointed out that you knew how to fly a plane and you could easily drive a car? Have you pointed that out before? Well, they love that, don't they? Yes. <laughs> so why do, you, why do we yell at that person? Rolling the anger. Stop, stop. All right, shh, shh, shh. We have a, a, why do we yell? We're just rolling the anger. What does that mean, rolling I'm the angry anger? angry about person A, and I'm actually... Oh, you're A. angry about someone else, so this person is stupid enough to love you, so you take it out on them. Is, is that correct? True, yeah. Thank you. Now, is that smart or not too much? Not too so much. Not too much. Why do we yell at this person? Um, because her response is maybe more um, traumatic to me than the Oh, facts. he's a victim. <laughs> oh, oh, that person frightened him with, their, with the comment. <laughs> he's a victim of the loud comment of that other person. Is that what I just heard? I'm sticking Thank to you. <laughs> what do we yell for? We don't want to be wrong. Oh, he doesn't want to be wrong. So you yell, scream, and act like a moron. Does that prove you're right or an idiot? Idiot. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Why do we yell at this person? Because you're reacting to, what else am I doing wrong? Or it's a compilation of prior feedback. On oh, we're things. back to the rolling comment again. Another, we have another one, roller over here. Why do we yell at this person? Two words. Ego and pride. Too much ego and too much pride. Now I have a question. Do we pay a price later for this prideful and egotistical outburst? Immediate. Yes, yeah. immediate. <laughs> now, a happy price or a sad price? A, a, a smart outburst or perhaps a dumb outburst? Let's go with the big dumb on this one. Too much ego and pride. Now, I'm going to give you two examples of ego and pride, a negative and a positive. First, the negative. There's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto, published by Dr. Atul Gawande from Harvard Medical School. Have any of you read this book, The Checklist Manifesto? Many of you. It's a great book. By the way, Dr. Gawande is a wonderful guy. In his book, he makes a sobering point. If you go in for a surgery and the nurse asks the doctor a series of questions from a simple checklist before the surgery, the odds on unneeded infection plummet, the death rates cut by two-thirds. The huge majority of hospitals around the world do not allow the nurse to ask the doctor the questions. What is the first question? Did you wash your hands? Ego. According to Dr. Gwandi, more people have died because of the egos of surgeons than died in the Vietnam War, the Afghan War, and the Iraqi War combined. Ego. That's the negative. Now for the positive. For nine years, I trained the admirals in our fine United States Navy. If any of you have ever done billing with the military, I don't charge them money. Why? Their billing bureaucracy is such a phenomenal pain in the butt. I said, we'll both make more money if you pay me nothing. So don't help me here. <laughs> they don't give me money, but they give me treats. A few years ago, my treat, day in a nuclear submarine. Me and eight other old men got to go out on a nuclear submarine for a whole day, diving under the waters and pretending to torpedo things. Oh, that was so much fun. Two years later, I got a better treat. Where did I get to go? Highway to the danger zone. Have any of you seen the movie Top Gun? I got to fly 95 minutes on a United States Navy Top Gun fighter jet. Six Gs flying upside down. Got to fly the plane myself for about 10 minutes. And I am proud to say, I did not throw up. <laughs> I noticed before we take off, this kid is asking my host, Admiral Mark Guadagnini, a series of questions from a checklist. First question for the, for the doctor is, did you wash your hands? First question for the pilot is, how much fuel do you have? I said, sir, this is very puzzling. I said, the doctor, don't like the nurse asking the question for the ego's too big. And I said, no offense, sir, nobody in the world's got a bigger ego than the United States Navy Top Gun fighter jet pilot who becomes an admiral. You got the biggest ego in the whole world. Hey, you don't care the kid asks you the question. I said, sir, what is the difference? He said, Marshall, there's a huge difference. That operation crashes, you die. That plane crashes, I die. He said, you put a gun to the doctor's head and said, you know, sir, if this patient dies of an unneeded infection, I'm going to blow your brains out. 
They'd ask the questions twice. Well, how important is ego and pride? Every day we make it more important than our health, more important than our safety, more important than the people we love. Everyone look up here, smile, take a deep breath and go, ah, how about that ego and pride thing? Let it go, let it go, let it go. Ask, listen, think, thank. Now the next thing is called respond. How many of you are familiar with the term 360 degree feedback? Have you heard this term before? Yes, most of you have heard this term. I'm a pioneer in the world of 360 degree feedback, a pioneer. I'm going to warn you in advance, as your journey through life, it's not always good when people constantly refer to you as a pioneer. What does that word mean? Old. Then it gets worse. They give you the ever so dreaded Lifetime Achievement Award. What's that one mean? Looks like he's about to go now. <laughs> well, I don't know much about much. I know a whole lot about how to respond to feedback. If you ever get such feedback the rest of your life, I'll tell you exactly how I teach all my clients to deal with this. Positive, simple, focused, and fast. It sounds like this. Miss Coworker, we're going through this feedback process. First thing I'd like to say is thanks to everybody who participated. I don't know who said what. A lot of people took the time to help me. I want to say how grateful I am. Second, much of my feedback is positive. Ethical, dedicated, hardworking, caring about the company and customers, and creative, and getting results. There's important things to me. I hope we'd score high, and they did. I want to say how grateful I am. And don't say but, say and, there's something I'd like to do better. My advice, pick one thing. Don't pick a laundry list. You're not going to change a laundry list anyway. Whatever you pick, come from your heart. I'd say, Miss Coworker, there's something I want to do better. I want to be a better listener. If I'm not listening to you or the people around you, I am sorry. Please accept my apologies. There's no excuse. We all make mistakes. What should I do when I make a mistake? Apologize. If I feel like blaming somebody for my problems, who is the best person in the world for me to blame for my problems? Blame this person. Then don't ask for more feedback about the past. Any of you notice your direct reports, they don't like to give you negative feedback? You notice that. See, there's a reason. They haven't found it to be a career-enhancing strategy. <laughs> don't ask for more feedback about the past. Ask for ideas for the future. Feed forward. I'd say, Miss Coworker, I'm not going to ask you about the past. I can't change it anyway. Give me ideas for the future. Whatever she says, sit there, shut up, listen, take notes, say thank you, don't judge. Never promise to do everything people say. Leadership's not a popularity contest. I say, I can't do everything you and everybody suggest. I'm gonna listen to everybody and think of all the ideas and do what I can. I can't change the past, change the future. Can't get better at everything. Certainly get better at one thing. If you don't mind, I'm gonna involve you and ask you to help me get better. Then what do you do? Involve that person. Change, and the key to making everything I just taught you tonight work is you have to follow up and stick with it. What's follow up sound like? Mr. Coworker, two months ago I said I wanted to be a positive and open-minded listener. Based on the last two months, give me ideas for the next two months. Feed forward. 